Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Animal Liberation Hour, where we seek insight from animal rights and liberation activists around the world so that we can think, reflect, learn, and be inspired. My name is Trey Morrow, and for this episode, I sat down with the author of Bear Boy, Justin Barker. Bear Boy is an incredible book. If you have not read it, please do. I read it in one night. I couldn't put it down. It is a page turner. It is inspirational. It's such a beautiful book. It's a beautiful story, and I hope you all will pick that up. I don't think anything will be spoiled if you haven't read it yet in our conversation today, but I definitely recommend that you read the book. Before we get into the episode, I want to remind you that the Animal Liberation Hour podcast is a project of animal activism mentorship. AAM is a free multinational program that helps aspiring animal rights activists, as well as those who are already activists but want to take their activism to the next level. From one-on-one mentorship to free workshops and trainings to this podcast, AAM seeks to empower humans to fight for animals so that the world will have more activists and we can achieve liberation sooner. For more information, visit AnimalActivismMentorship.com and follow AAM on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship. You can keep up with the Animal Liberation Hour on AAM's social media, too. Animal Activism Mentorship is fueled by FARM, FARM Animal Rights Movement. Without further ado, we'll get to the conversation I had with Justin Barker, author of Bear Boy. I hope that you get as much out of the conversation as I did. Enjoy. Well, welcome to the podcast, Justin. Uh, I'm so excited you're here. Your book is literally one of my favorite books of all time, Bear what? Boy. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I love it so, so much. I've already told you the story of, you know, how I, I, I started reading it. I was like, oh, I'm going to read a chapter or two tonight. I stayed up till four in the morning reading the whole thing cover to cover. I just loved it so much. Um, thank you for writing it, man. I, it's, it's such a great book, and I think it's going to inspire a lot of people. Yeah, well, thanks. It's so nice to like hear from such a like seasoned activist that they you felt inspired by it. So uh, that means a lot to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're gonna dive into the book more later, but just right up front, uh, I wanted to ask you: um, so many people go to zoos because they love animals and they want to see them and they want to interact with them. But why are zoos wrong? I mean, I think that zoos is like a perfect example of what's wrong with how humans often look at nature. That the idea that we bring animals to our, the cities that we live in, um, that we somehow have, as humans, have the right to like extract animals from the wild or continue to breed animals in captivity to, so that we can go see an animal that should be living on the other side of the world in our city. Like just that idea, the um, audacity that humans have a right to that. Um, and then that's somehow educational is, uh, is very surreal to me. <laughs> uh, and the industry is very problematic like so many of the like animal you know in industries that use animals they've the zoo industry has figured out a way to like make people feel better about captivity uh that oftentimes you look at an animal and the exterior of their cage looks really nice the plants you're in the forest there's they've done a lot to make people feel better about the experience um but nothing has really changed in the last hundred years when it comes to um keeping animals in cages most animals aren't you know their basic needs aren't being met in captivity and to say otherwise is very naive on the front of the the zoo industry uh And so I really think there's other ways to learn about animals and learn about nature. And I certainly, as a dad with a young child, um, 
and another one coming will never use, will never take my kids to the zoo uh, because I don't want them to think that they have dominion over nature or other animals, that, that, that that's actually essentially what we're teaching people. Um, and the zoo industry has done everything they can to try to um, paint a rosier picture that then is real. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I visited the zoo when I was a kid. There's actually um, a picture somewhere um, of me meeting a giraffe at the zoo. And it's a, it's a picture that I loved for so long. And, you know, I loved that picture because we were meeting this animal, spending family time together, seeing this animal that, you know, I guess you just don't think of it sometimes when you're when you're a kid or, or even into adulthood. Sometimes animals, I guess they're so different from us in some ways that, you know, when we think of treat others how you would want to be treated, we don't always think of animals. We don't think about, we think about our interaction with them in that moment, not the fact that once we walk away, it's a lifetime of confinement for them, you know. I mean, drafts are particularly, you know, struggle in captivity. You know, there's so many animals like ungulates, you know, who kind of spend their whole lives on, on, um, you know, on dirt and natch, you know, are, are kind of oriented towards that, end up living their lives on concrete. And it's really a trip to see, I mean, every animal has their story and struggle in captivity, but drafts are particularly, um, struggle in captivity when you actually look at like the death rates of giraffes in captivity and the death rates of um, of young giraffe uh, it's pretty shocking and that you know that extends to all animals but you would just think oh it's like a giraffe living in a cage is kind of benign like they're pretty chill like they run but you know like you could start trying to tell us to tell yourself the story of like <laughs> why drafts might maybe are okay in captivity but at the end of the day like it just doesn't you know their basic needs are not met yeah and it comes down to they're just not ours right they they're not ours so that's it uh, so We'll, we'll get into the book a little bit. Um, toward the beginning of your book, Bear Boy, uh, you tell the origin story of how you became an animal activist. And reading the story, I, I, it seems so simple to me because you, you learned about an injustice. You acted immediately. And this is when you were a kid in, in the 90s. And... Uh, it, it's often difficult to get through to grown adults in 2021 and in, in the age of information. Um, but you as a, as a young teenager um, were able to just understand this message instantly. Um, can you just talk about that moment in your origin story? Uh, uh, and can you um, just talk about how you were impacted? Of course. Yeah, you know, I was, I struggled as a kid uh, in the suburbs in, in California and like I was very privileged. My parents had full-time jobs, very much a middle-class family. So in that way, we didn't struggle, but I struggled because I was struggling with my identity and understanding of who I was. And there was a lot of bullying happening. And so the suburbs were just like, where I was living, that it wasn't working for me. And to discover a book about animal rights, you know, I always had a love for animals. I always was like, was a kind of a environmentalist from a very young age. Uh, but to discover that book from Ingrid uh, about animal rights and how young people can create change for animals was a huge shift in my life personally uh, because it was so empowering. I went from being in a place where I felt very unempowered and struggling to, and to having empathy and caring for animals and being inspired to like stand up for them in a way that I couldn't even stand up for myself. But my hope, I love the idea of the origin story because in time, you know, 
as I learned to stand up for animals and speak up for animals, uh, I certainly like kind of discovered how to speak up for myself and, and find, um, find power in that. So in that way, it's so cool to be, you know, to, to learn about activism because it just, the, the work that we do as activists don't just impact, you know, the animals or whatever cause that we um, d decide to embrace, but also really it changes our lives in a way. And that was one thing I really hope to get across in the, in this book. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you definitely did. Um, I, th I think as, as young people, sometimes, you know, I, I think that I had the feeling when I was young, first, first of all, I, maybe I just didn't know what all was wrong with the world because I, I lived a pretty privileged life myself. And second of all, I, I think sometimes kids and, and preteens and teenagers, they just feel um, powerless in so many instances, you know, I mean, when you're at school, somebody else is in charge. When you're at home, somebody else is in charge. You know, I mean, you kind of just sometimes you're just going through the motions as a as a kid. But um, you know, you found your power. Uh, I feel like you know you you were able to uh, to find it, and I just thought that was so inspiring. And and I hope that it will inspire you know not only kids to realize that you know. They have a voice, uh, but also everybody, because it, I mean, it's it's a message that's universal across all you know causes. I think um, I just I, I thought it was so great, and the book reads like a, a, a you know like fiction, even though even though it's not. Yeah, and I love that. Yeah, it feels that moment felt like a, a superhero origin story, like out of a comic book or something like that. You know you. I just have this image in my mind, you know, you put your finger on this book and, you know, the rest is history. And it really was. I mean, it's crazy to think about. And there's other thing, like this is like this Bear Boy is about a lot of different things, but one of them is how powerful a single book is. How powerful like reading and learning about the world and how that can change your life. And it was, it literally you and I wouldn't be on talking today if I hadn't found that book when I was 13 years old and all sorts, you know, I could look back and be like how that book literally, I mean, it's cliche, but that finding a book about animal rights changed the trajectory of my life in a way that I can't even understand. Um, but it certainly turned me into an activist for animals and then the empowerment I found through that, whoa, like also extended that activism to social justice and helped me like critically think about the capitalist system and how that impacts all of our lives in crazy ways. Um, so what a powerful thing to think that one book can shift your life. Yeah, and it comes full circle because I think your book is gonna do the same uh, for others. Um, so, I feel like it's our duty to help one another, you know, and, and you discovered this so early uh, in your life, like we talked about. Talk about finding your voice and finding strength um, and, and realizing that one teenage boy or, or girl or whoever can make a difference. You know, a lot of young people and people have read the book have reached out to me and said like, how did you, where did the like, I would, could never call the mayor and tell him there's, he's doing something wrong in this city. Like a lot of like maybe more shy folks who are animal activists, but were really surprised by my like, uh, I guess gumption or my willingness to just like call people. And partly, that was me like I was like opinionated and had a very strong view of the world and like often funneled those feelings opinions in the direction of my parents you know so it didn't make me a very um easy kid to raise because I had opinions about everything and so to be able to like funnel that energy towards activism and other adults who you know 
somehow were doing something wrong to animals or weren't responding to my requests in the way that I hoped that was kind of, that came pretty naturally. But it's interesting, I got a, I actually got a text, this, uh, an instant message from, oh my God, that's so old school, instant message. <laughs> I got a, a direct message on Instagram from a mom who said, Our, my 10 year old daughter's reading this book right now and she just thinks what you did was so cool and she's really shy, but she wants to start a dialogue with the fishermen and the environmentalists uh, in, on Cape Cod. Uh, and she's 10 and can she email you about some advice? And, and I said, absolutely, I'd love to like give her some advice or give her some words of wisdom. But it was really, it was interesting to think about because I hope that this book, like even, I hope that like my ability to call the mayor and just be over the top annoying until things changed um, will inspire other kids who may be shy and not oriented in that way to be like, wow, I have, I am powerful as a young person. And I really like think that, and I have created more change in the world as a young person that I ever, than I ever have as an, as an adult. And like, that's something I need to explore, but my ability to only focus on animal activism and the change I wanted to create and not worry about putting food on the table, and all that, it was, I just think that that's, a, it's a good reminder for young people that they have, a lot of young people have all of the resources they need to be able to create big change in their communities. Um, and I hope that this book transmits that message because I really, I don't think adults are really um, in a place, especially adults in places of in places of power. They're not in a place to imagine uh, the future, and young people are. I think that young people are the only people who should be imagining what the future holds because they're going to be in the future, and we, you know, we'll be there, but we're going to be <laughs> aging and, and old, but. I just really hope young people realize how much power they have to create change. And I certainly felt that as a young person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's so powerful. I mean, I've done activism with some, some young kids and just uh, when a, when a child speaks, I mean, the, the gravity of what they're saying, I mean, it just, it just cuts right to you, man. And if they say something profound, I mean, anytime anybody says something profound, that's great. But when a when a child or a kid says it, um, yeah, I mean, it, I I feel like it's different in a way. It is different. So I I organize events as an activist. I help with campaigns, and that can be uh, difficult. But you were doing it with dial-up internet, having to make long-distance calls like behind your parents' back before they found the bill. Um, you know, how did you stay motivated and, and keep faith in yourself as an activist, especially since, you know, you didn't really have a ton of experience? How did you stay focused? How did you stay motivated? Well, I'll tell you the one thing that kept me motivated and helped me continuing to move forward um, was the mentorships I had. I, it was so important in my early days because, you know, I read, you know, I read that book that was geared towards kids, but then that only went so far. That inspired me to understand, whoa, like animals are, you know, meat is dead animals that have been abused. I'm going vegetarian. Zoos are a problem, let me go and investigate. Um, but there was plenty of struggles that we all face. Um, and I particularly face as a young kid, not knowing, you know, like not having a, not knowing how to best approach things. But the fact that I had these mentors, these older activists who had some sort of experience that I could always just call up when things were getting rough was incredibly important. 
And, you know, since the books come out and people kind of ask me this question, like I often mention, you know, animal activism mentorship, that like these mentorships are so like what you've created and what to you, the space that you've created for new fresh activists or people that maybe not, might, may not even be activists yet, like to like turn to and get some guidance was is so, so important. Um, and so I'd say that like building a community of people as you're in getting into activism that you can turn to because stuff's not easy. Like creating change in the world is not easy. There can be very dark, depressing, you know, places uh, that, that you go and it just feels like an uphill battle sometimes. Um, so to be able to like turn to people, I think that's really, that was really, really critical for me. Um, and to, to get advice from all sorts of people. Like it was amazing how many people uh, supported me, how many activists supported me and how many organizations got, I mean, the staff at PUDA used to send me like cards that like the whole staff would sign and would send me boxes of things. And to know, like to just be constantly getting boxes of like animal rights, swag was so cool like those kind of small things really like was were inspiring uh and then just celebrating the little wins like as a young person like when a when a tv show would cover the the bears that was so exciting to me and like while like it wasn't like a big win for the bears it was like a step in the direction of 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 creating change so I think those two things of like mentorships and support and then like being like, oh, like how do we celebrate the small little steps that we're taking in the right direction? Uh, and I can just talking to you now, I can feel like I used to jump up and down and scream and spin around when a TV show or an article had come out about the bears because it was like, oh my God, like more people are gonna learn about this story. More people are gonna like hopefully and like, second guest captivity because of the bear's story and that was just like whoa like that was really exciting yeah so you you mentioned that um you know when you found that book you went vegetarian you're vegan now um I, sometimes i feel like in our movement there's this thing where unless you're vegan you, you're not even allowed to partake in activism now you know, obviously, you know, people that are vegan, we, w we want everybody to be vegan because, you know, no animal oppression is okay. But at the same time, I mean, I would assume, and I, I would like for you to tell me, but I would assume the activism probably helped you work your way to that realization in, in being vegan. So can you talk about that a little bit? And, and also, you know, your opinion on that, like, should we I mean, should should non vegans be able to do animal rights activism and be accepted by you know the vegans? Like, what, what's what's your take on all that? I mean, I'll tell you, at my age, I love a hardcore vegan. I really do. Like, I love somebody who just is like straight up. Like, I'm just gonna like be a hardcore vegan and like. Maybe, maybe even like talk shit about like vegetarians. <laughs> like I, I admire that. Like I really do admire that, like that passion and that like, I don't know, I just love that. Like I really do. Um, I'm not that person. I don't, and I maybe was when I was younger. Like I, when I was like, and so there's a few scenes in the book, you know, I think that kind of highlights that, but I really, I just have like over the years, I've realized that like people are all on their own journeys and that the only thing we can do is like live the thing, the, our truths and share what we know and, and to get frustrated, even though it is frustrating at times, like to like get mad about what other people are doing is like such a waste of energy. Because that's not like the the anger and the frustration that like, or the like exclusion, like, oh, well, you're not like me. So I'm, you aren't eligible to whatever. Um, I just think that's like, 
wasting energy where that could be funneled in other directions. And one of the things I really wanted to get across in the book, because I've discovered this over the years, um, is that like even people that may not be animal activists or be vegetarian or I at I at all identify like with my view of the world, like can people do care about animals and how do we like bring them into the fold to ultimately um, further our cause? And like in that situation, like in that way, like the zookeepers were amazing allies and have always been amazing allies in my work uh, because I know that like while they actively participate in a system that are keeping animals in captivity, that I think that most zookeepers care about animals. And that care may look different, but like to not like honor that love of animals they have and use that as a way to like help them become whistleblowers or realize that they're struggling too in a system that doesn't offer them money. You know, I just think, and, and in the book, I don't want to reveal too much, but one of my biggest, biggest enemies in the book. As a young person, I would call her, she was my number one enemy, the zoo, the zoo director of the Sacramento Zoo. And I literally visualized her, I still to this day can visualize her as Corella DeVille, like her perm, like I just still see her as the villain. But just a few years ago, I was like, I want to see what, let's, I want to have coffee with this person and see what, uh, what her story is now. And the fact that we agreed that the Ringling Brothers Circus, it was great that it's closed and that no whales should live in captivity and that elephants shouldn't be in captivity. I just was kind of blown away because I was like, I never thought that this person who spent their whole career keeping animals in cages, that we would ever see eye to eye on anything. And I just think that was like such a good reminder that like we need to bring people into the fold wherever they are to create change. And whether that's how the choices people are making with their diets or the role, you know, where they work, like how do we find the little bits of commonality to further our cause for the animals? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Like. Obviously, as a vegan, I want everybody to be vegan. And it's it's so tempting if you see somebody fighting for one area uh, or, or one particular species of animal and, you know, they're eating the other or something like that. You know, I mean, you kind of you want to call out that hypocrisy. And, and, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but at the same time, like, can we be inclusive? And, you know, if if, you know, if a non-vegan and, and a vegan care about circus animals let's team up and get it done for the circus animals and afterwards you know invite that person out for a vegan meal and try to you know get them to be vegan too or you know how whatever your strategy is but yeah i totally agree i mean let's let's um let's bring people together for animals as as much as we can i think that's a i think that's a great strategy um so yeah my next question was actually about mentorship and you already covered that so <laughs> um but I, I guess you can talk about it a little more because I mean I'm how different was that mentorship because you know when I was younger um, some of my mentors not not relating to animal rights um, but you know they were like teachers and people that I you know I was around um, so in in the book you're pretty much dialing up strangers like please help me <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean which there's something to be said for because that's not easy to do um so you know how talk about how that might have been different you know in in the 90s like calling people long distance on on a on a on a prayer you know hoping that they're gonna be able to help a young kid who's trying to help animals I mean, the world is so different now with like technology and the way that people can easily connect on Instagram and it's like people can connect it so much more easier than they, than 
we were able to back then. Um, but one of the things I always did um, as a young person is when I would meet somebody new on the phone, I would always say, is there anyone else that you think I should connect with? And it was like this networking game. And it was crazy to think back on like how many people I called uh, and got to know because of that simple question of like, who is there somebody else? Like, thank you so much. Like who else do you think I should connect with? Uh, and I remember that very vividly of just the like networking side of things. And some folks I resonated with and some I didn't. And so that kind of like part of the deal was really like getting to know people or talking to people and then like resonating with them. And, and one person that I write about quite a bit in the book, Doris is, um, was like a local activist for years um, in Sacramento and she was amazing. Like, and I called her all of the time and like, and she was very much geared towards like activism, animal rights, advice. Um, she had a phone, she had a telephone tree uh, for animal rights. And that was like how like long ago this was, was people would literally like had a newsletter and there'd be like a telephone tree and people would call and be like, hey, uh, this so-and-so is happening and then they'd have their list of people and that they just spread the spread these newsletters through through uh the phone tree and that was really cool um but i'll say that she was very much focused on my activism and helping me there but i had a therapist too who was also a mentor uh who like help me with my personal and familial things. So I guess that's to say that like, it wasn't just one person that was like mentoring me. There was like a whole bunch of people that I, you know, connected with and supported me in different aspects of my life. So, you know, I think that like, we don't necessarily need just one mentor in our life. We need, you know, a bunch of people to help support the different all the aspects of being human and and humans who are looking to create change in the world. Yeah, definitely. Something interesting to um, about activism to me is, you know, my whole life I've mostly hung around people my own age. Um, but when it came to activism, all of a sudden I'm hanging out with, you know, people that are older than my parents the same way I would hang out with somebody my own age just – you know, as a peer or as a colleague or a fellow activist or whatever the case may be. I think it's so cool how, you know, when you join together for a common cause, like some of those barriers can be broken down. And it felt like in the book that, you know, some of your friends were, you know, more than twice your age. Um, I, I thought I thought that was something that was, was really cool too. Did those relationships kind of feel like uh, a, a, a parent helping along a young child or did they feel more like uh, that, you know, peer to peer or, or a little bit of both or? Yeah, it kind of depended on, it was always felt like it didn't fair, it feel parental at all. Cause it was always often like, you know, Doris, who is like my big mentor. Um, she was telling me things that my parents would never tell me. And like, you know, I mean, I remember at some point she'd tell me stories of like that the uh, FBI had bugged her car and her house because there, there was this big sting against animal activists uh, because of these um, laboratory fires in Davis. Um, and it's crazy because she was like, oh, and call this phone number. And if it buzzes this way, you know, the feds are listening in. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I used to call that number often. And then like one day, like the phone was like, it made the sound. I was like, oh, the feds are listening. So my parents would never like do that. <laughs> um, and she often was talking, you know, like, I don't know, there was always like, it was always kind of on the edge of like, it always felt a little edgy with like what she was sharing with me because it was definitely like adult activism, radical, um, a radical approach, uh, 
which I loved. It was like, oh my God, this is very satisfying as a young person to like hear about like the Animal Liberation Front. And um, I don't know. So it wasn't, it wasn't parental, but it definitely was satisfying uh, to have an older activist who had experienced things that I probably will never experience of like getting bugged and having the FBI chase after me. Like, this is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So that's so cool that you got to learn all that stuff, especially from such a young age and, and uh, have that mentorship. That's that's awesome. Um, so in the book, you know, it's it's a coming of age story um, and, and you're really finding your identity uh, in, in many different ways. Um, can you talk about how you managed to navigate that? And do you have any advice for kids and teenagers who are going through that now? I mean, I think that one of the things that like, I mean, kids are so di different these days. We're like in such a different world. But the one thing I learned is that that rather than assimilating and trying to fit into the crowd like what really is empowering and important is like being like not the same as your peers and different from your peers um so that was like one thing that i kind of learned and it and i think activism really helped because like being a vegetarian or a vegan being a vegetarian in the 90s like that was like vegan was not even like that was really a bad word but like vegetarian was a whole other thing as a young person um and i think that the like being able to be like i'm not going to do the same as i'm not going to be like my parents in how i eat and i'm not going to take on the stat you know I'm, i don't support the status quo of how our culture and and society treats animals um, and so by being on the edges of the norm in that realm and really helped me just decide like, oh, right, like, I'm just going to be on the edges of the norm across the board. <laughs> and um, I think that was, that's really important is that, is to just find, you know, to find the things that you love and you care about and just like, let everyone know about it. <laughs> And, and that really was, that helped me really transition from being somebody who struggled a lot and, and tried to hide away to feeling really empowered across, you know, across my, uh, my identity. You talk about it a little bit in the, in the book, but what was your um, sense of how your peers started to perceive you you know, once you were getting media attention, um, you know, about the bears and, you know, really stepping into your own as a successful activist, um, how did it, how did it change? Um, were there any like new formed relationships based on that? Or, you know, did people view you a, a little differently? I mean, I think just the media coverage help people view me differently. The fact that like I was on like the local news and the na you know national news and in magazines that was like whoa like this is like Justin's doing something other than most the kids in school you know so I think that helped um, just the co the media coverage helped um, get people's attention uh, and and then like there was a lot of curiosity because of that there was like there was a lot of curiosity around the vegetarianism and there was certainly people like that were attracted to what i was doing uh for the animals but mainly it, it the thing shifted when i came out as gay at the time i'm queer now um or I identify as queer now but that really helped the situation because there wasn't necessarily a big community of animal activists at my school, but there was a very actually big community of like young, gay, queer kids. Um, and then once that, once I discovered that crew, um, 
they, you know, we had that, you know, in common and then they were like much more interested in my activism, not like jumping on board, but because we were close friends, like entertained vegetarian diet and didn't hate me when I invited them over for movie night and it was actual like slaughterhouse footage from PETA. <laughs> yeah, that's that's so interesting. Like you had a, a, a common bond over something else um, and that kind of got your foot in the door in a way for the animal stuff too. And, and of course, you know, those bonds were special on their own. Um, so not only did you have to fight to find your own identity and fight for your own freedom uh, in a way as a teenager, but you had to have, uh, you had to fight to have your voice heard in your own book. The part about you finding your sexuality almost didn't make it in. I'm so glad that it did. Can you talk about that experience and why, why were some people wanting you to keep that out of the book? So I, when I originally finished writing this book or the whole time that I was writing this book, because I started that about 10 years ago, um, I imagined I wanted it like a traditional book deal. I imagine that would be like the best place if one of the house, like the big houses picked up this book, that that would create a platform in a way that that, that was the best way to, to, to um, offer this book to the world. And, and so that was the direction I was heading. Once the book was written, I started pitching agents. Uh, that took a long time to finally get an agent. When I got an agent, I was very excited about getting an agent because, whoa, like that's just like huge deal, like in a lot of people's worlds. And it was a big deal for me too. And immediately after signing my, the agreement with the agent, she was like, well, we need to rethink this book. And I want this book to be geared towards more young people. And I think the only way to do that is to um, take out any reference, any explicit reference to your sexuality. And that kind of hurt because I thought that the story of freedom and the juxtaposition of like animals freedom and my own freedom uh, was like an important juxtaposition, but she didn't think so. And I, I'm somebody who like, I'm a collaborator at the end of the day. I want to like work with people to help improve whatever project I'm working on. And I'm not the, I shouldn't be the final say in anything. Um, but so I went along with it. I was like, okay, uh, I, that sounds good. And she went in and literally went through and just chopped the whole, that bit out of the book. And it didn't feel good, but I trusted her that like, okay, she's, she's been in the publishing industry. She's going to champion this book. And, uh, and so I went along with it. And then about like a year into her having the book and shopping it around and getting some interest, but not a lot. She's like, oh, we need to build your platform, which anyone that's like ever tried to pitch a book will like know the publishing industry wants, because it's an old, old school industry, like they basically want to sign people who already have followings, big followings, because the idea is that anyone that has a massive following that following will just go and buy the book. And then the publisher doesn't have to do much to actually sell the book. <laughs> um, and so she was like, oh, well, the note I'm getting back from publishers is you don't have a big enough following. So I need you to do write something controversial about, about, the, about Greta Thunberg. <laughs> and that just was, I did write it. I did write that piece and then and the piece was about like basically Greta at some point at the UN was like, oh, young people shouldn't have to be doing this. And so I wrote this piece about actually young people do have to do this because they're the only ones who can imagine it. But the idea that she wanted some salacious, some controversial piece about Greta was really sealed the deal. Um, Cause I was like, that's, 
Greta is like my hero. Like I love what she's doing for the world and how she's inspiring other young people. Why would I ever say anything bad about her? And, and so that was the point where I was like, okay, between that and eliminating the, L, the gay part of my story, I am walking away and very begrudgingly <laughs> decided to bring this book into the world. Uh, and now I'm very happy that that's the direction I've headed because it's the book has found success and is finding an audience. Um, but it's just a good reminder that like sometimes these gatekeepers or people that think they have you know, that they're in a position of power, like we just sometimes need to go our own way. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's kind of the story of. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, um, uh, a friend of mine who, who's, who's passed away now, uh, I shot a documentary about him, a short film. And um, he said, no one can tell your story like you could. And that rings true about this. I mean, it's, it's your story. Um, it, it's good to be a collaborator, but you know, I mean, some, <laughs> sometimes, I mean, I, I'm so glad that part made it into the book. I think it, um, I think it would have still been awesome without it, but I mean, it, it just really brings it all together. Um, and it, and it builds a stronger connection between you and the animals and, uh, I'm just so glad that part made it in. I think you made the right decision, my friend. I'm I'm glad that you went your own way on that. I know that's hard to do, too. Um, I've found myself in some like similar situations where I've got to choose between, you know, doing it my way or, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, I'm so glad you did and stepped out and did that. And it's a uh, it's a part of the book that I think is gonna resonate with people a lot and already has. So thanks for writing it and thanks for keeping it in. Cause I, I'm, I'm glad that you did. Um, so this, uh, this next question might be the most controversial. You might really make some people upset if you answer this the wrong way. What's your favorite Spice Girls song? <laughs> favorite Spice Girls song. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love stop is my favorite Spice Girl song. <laughs> <laughs> what makes your it... favorite Spice Girl song? <laughs> well, you know, it's the cliche answer, but wannabe because it, it's it's what introduced me to the Spice Girls. Me and a lot of people don't know this, but me and my uh, older cousin, we used to, and my little sister, my, my cousin would come over and we would just like rock out to the Spice Girls so freaking hard, dude. Like you don't even know. And uh, <laughs> she had us into all of that kind of that kind of music in the, in the '90s. Um, so, to my cousin, if you're listening to this, those were some good times. But but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a song about being clear about what you want, right? And a song about the importance of friendship. I mean, it's a good song, man. And just randomly slamming your body down and winding it all around, you know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like every, I mean, other than, oh, I'm not going to even say that, but I'll say that <laughs> I love most of the Spice Girl songs. Their third album, kind of questionable, but, um, but so good and had such a fun impact on my life and, um, and love to know that they're like still around and like probably going to tour in the U.S. next year. That'd be sick. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I had to ask that. Uh, <laughs> all right so what advice do you have for young people who want to become activists and that's you know that could be animal rights that could be that could be anything just just kids who you know want to want to fight for something and they're you know trying to find their voice trying to find their way in all of this um what what advice would you have for them I mean, I would say that I think first and foremost, like if you're passionate about something, uh, whatever it is, like what changes can you create in your own life to have an impact on the things you care about? It's very empowering as a young person to hear that 
animals were empowering. It was very sad to hear that animals were being exploited and killed for their, for their meat um, that I'd spent my whole life eating. But it was very empowering to learn that I actually could make a different choice. And that was a really important first step to being like, okay, I am going to shift my lifestyle um, to resonate with things I believe in. So I think that's like the first step, like how do we, that's so close to home of like the choices we make um, because we all can be activists every day in the choices we make. So I think that's the first step. And then the next one is just, what do you care about? Like, what are the things that you really resonate with? Because there's so many things in the world that need changing. Um, and sometimes it can be so overwhelming that you're just like, I'm not going to do anything. Um, but that's kind of not an option these days. It, you know, we all have to um, step up and, and um, create the world we want. So, you know, discovering the thing for me, it was about zoos. It was, I was so passionate about standing up for zoo animals. And, uh, and so instead of just being mad about the zoos, I went really close to home. And I think that that's the one thing I would recommend to young people is like, what are the big ideas or the big things that you believe need changing? And how do you start really close to whether it's in your town or at your school like start really close to home and creating change because those changes, those seemingly small changes that you make your personal choices, your choices you make at home, at school, in your community, those have big ripple effects. And we're, we're not in control of the, you know, how are those small little changes and shifts um, ripple out. So that's like my advice is like stay close to home in the changes you, you know you'd like to make and and like keep things simple and make sure you celebrate those small wins like even like as you know at some point I got like veg, veggie burgers on the line at my school and didn't really land very well but that felt like a win to me the fact that like even the fact that there was like a 24 pack of veggie burgers in the freezer at school like that that's that was a big shift um so i think that's really important is staying close to home and celebrating the small wins for young people i really like um jane goodall's roots and shoots organization uh, because i like i like jane's approach to activism like I really love Jane Goodall. She's not like a hardcore activist, but she is an activist. She's like the most grassroots activist, most famous grassroots activist ever. Like, I just love what she does. Um, and I love um, how Jane's approach to creating change for animals is also about the environment and humans that like all of these things intersect that, you know, while she believes in conservation, taking care of the people on the edge of these spaces that are, cons are, are saved for, for the animals, like the well-being of the people matter. So I really love Roots and Shoots. Um, and it's an activist, you know, engaged organization for young people. So I would say if you're like, where do I start? And I don't have any place, I don't have any reference that Roots and Shoots is a cool place to start. And then finally, I, um, people have been asking me this question. I just had somebody ask me like, oh, I really want to be more engaged in my, my work for animals. And uh, I said, there's this organization called Animal Activism Mentorship. And you should really check them out. Like, and I mean, I, I've been talking about your mentorships to, to folks because I really think it's important. It's like, you've essentially structured, you've created some structure around a very critical part of activism. Uh, and so I just think that's really powerful and love that you've done that because to me, that's one of the most important things of young, for activists, young or old, is to find mentors and support systems. Well, we certainly appreciate that. And it 
thanks thanks for um, bringing that up uh, about Jane Goodall's thing. She wrote a beautiful foreword to your book as well. I hope that people will check the book out, um, <laughs> buy it. It's amazing. This is one you're going to want to look back at and, <laughs> and read over and over again. It's absolutely incredible. Justin, thank you for everything. Thank you for your inspiring story. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast. And uh, yeah, man, we'll see you next time. Thank you. And thanks for everything you're doing and all the activists you're inspiring all over the place. Really admire what you're doing. Appreciate that, brother. Until next time. I hope that you all were as inspired by Justin as I am. The book is so incredible. Please pick it up, Bear Boy. If you're looking for a gift for someone who's a young activist, this is the perfect gift. It's such an incredible story, and it's going to inspire people for a long time to come. Thank you all so much for being here and for listening. Please rate and review the podcast. It helps others find it more easily, and the more people that find it, the more people can be inspired by the guests interviewed on our show and turn that into actionable change for the animals. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship, where you can keep up with the podcast as well as everything AAM. One more reminder that you can sign up for a free mentor to help you with your activism at AnimalActivismMentorship.com. If you needed a sign that you should be an activist for animals, this is it. Remember that it will take all of us to achieve animal liberation. Stay focused, stay positive, be effective, and keep doing your part. Until next time.